All right. Well, my clock is 1 p.m., so we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Michelle Sweetzer, one of the co-chairs of the Educational Program Committee. Uh, we're happy to have you here for our final Society of Ohio Archivists virtual meeting session today. Uh, this session is the Appalachian Regional Heritage Stewardship Program, Creating and Sustaining Communities of Opportunity. Before I introduce our speaker, a few housekeeping details. I uh, want to remind you that captions are enabled. You can open and close those at the bottom of your screen. And we will save uh, Q&A for the end. So at any point, if you have a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat and I'll read them out when we get to that portion of the um, today's presentation. And to introduce our speaker today, uh, we have Diani Fega, who is the Director of Preservation Services at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, also known as CACHA. She works with libraries, archives, museums, and other cultural organizations to conduct needs and risk assessments, assist in disaster planning, and help develop policy and planning documents for collections. Diani is also develops and presents education programs and preservation and conservation concerns. Before joining the staff of CCAHA in 2010 as preservation specialist, Diani worked in the Brooklyn Museum Library and Archives. She's also worked in the New York Public Library's Preservation Division for the Conference Board and in the Special Collections and Archives at Kent State University. She received her MS in Library and Information Science with a Certificate in Archives at Pratt Institute and her BM in Music Business from NYU. She's a native Ohioan and is delighted to be able to bring preservation resources to her home state through the NEH-funded Regional Heritage Stewardship Program. I'll now turn things over to Diani. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thanks to all of you who are joining me this afternoon, joining us. Um, I actually, I of course, I looked at the program, but I didn't even really put it together that this was the last session of the day. So thank you for sticking around. Um, I am going to turn my video off, largely just so I don't distract myself, but I'll be back at the end when we're going to do questions. Um, so yeah, as Michelle mentioned, uh, I am the Director of Preservation Services at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. I'll tell you more about my organization in just a moment, um, but I am here today to talk about one of the specific initiatives that we are really excited um, to be undertaking that has a place in Ohio. So um, this program is funded through the National Endowment for the Humanities. So I definitely want to say that off the top and um, give a, a huge thank you to the NEH for funding this preservation focused initiative that I'm going to tell you a lot more about. A little bit about the project lead and the organization that I work for the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. Um, we are located in Philadelphia, but we work all over the country and increasingly even a bit internationally as well. Um, we are a nonprofit conservation facility specializing in the treatment of works on paper, photographs, and books through conservation and digital imaging services. Aside from the conservation treatment work that we do, kind of the hands-on work, which was our founding focus and goal when we were established in 1977, um, we also offer a variety of other services, such as fellowship opportunities, fundraising support, and disaster assistance. The department that I work for, which is the Preservation Services Office, is really the education and outreach arm of the organization. So as mentioned in my bio, we present educational programs, conduct preservation assessments, um, and assist institutions with the development of many institutional plans, including collections management policies, preservation plans, emergency plans, and more. And we serve 
all different types of institutions. Um, our, our primary audience, of course, is nonprofit cultural collecting organizations, but we also work with private individuals, governmental organizations, um, corporate archives, et cetera, both uh, in our mid-Atlantic region and as I mentioned, throughout the, the nation. Um, Oh, uh, this is just a snapshot of uh, some of our team looking at the eclipse a few weeks ago. Um, just wanted to uh, indicate that uh, we have individuals on our team with background in a variety of different fields. You know, anything from the very obvious uh, conservation and collections management to folks who studied film and uh, had a previous life as social workers. So we really, we, we bring a lot of different facets to the work that we do with collecting organizations. Um, this is just, uh, you know, another way of looking at um, the, the range of the work that we do. Most of this, I already kind of went over. But the thing that I wanted to talk to you all about today is our Regional Heritage Stewardship Program, specifically the facet of the program that focuses on Appalachia. Um, so this is roughly <laughs> the region of Appalachia that is served. So Appalachian counties in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and West Virginia. I know Appalachia itself is much larger than that, but um, this, this is where we are working. Um, we also have a, a partner program in the Deep South, working with institutions in Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida. Um, but I am the project lead for the Appalachian Regional Heritage Stewardship Program. So <clears throat> that's what I would like to connect with you all about. Um, so back in 2016, this, this has been growing for at least in, in planning and uh, under wraps for a number of years at this point. Um, we were consulting with individuals for the American Association for State and Local History um, predominantly their, their field services alliance. And we kind of narrowed in on uh, two regions of the country that have both a relative density of cultural collecting organizations, but also limited access to conservators and other preservation expertise right within the region. Um, so that was one of the things that we were kind of trying to look at and address. Another thing that's a little different about this from some other somewhat similar programs that have run in the past, like the IMLS Connecting to Collections initiatives, is we're not looking at organizations on a state-by-state -state basis, but rather the, the region. So we kind of determined that um, most likely organizations that are based in southeastern Ohio, for example, might have more in common with organizations based in West Virginia than they would with organizations based in Cleveland. So when we do things on this state by state basis, there's often a focus and kind of a density of programming in um, a, a couple different areas of the state, um, you know, Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati most likely, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't uh, collecting organizations elsewhere in the state. Um, so this is an outreach model that combines in-person education and networking opportunities, targeted on-site consultation, um, remote consultation, and overall encouragement to develop a community infrastructure that will be sustainable. And the ultimate goal is, although that is always going to be somewhat of a moving target, is to link together a cohort of preservation partners to establish a long-term network for on-the-ground regional support. So how are we 
trying to actually do this. The whole point of providing these services is to create what we call cultural heritage communities that are supported by sustainable infrastructure. But what does this actually mean in practice? It means a community that shares preservation responsibility, expertise, and resources using collective systems of communication, communion, and education that can be sustained past the conservation center's involvement. So we're trying to set up something that will outlive our direct uh, work on this project, although we have no specific uh, interest or intentions in, in, in leaving this initiative, but you know, it is grant funded. So we have that element of sustainability in mind. Um, this is just kind of the, uh, putting those, those three priorities, uh, into some, um, kind of practical, this is what this might look like. Um, and I, I will, of course, tell you a lot more about what it is going to look like in practice over the rest of this presentation. Um, this is, uh, since we launched this project in uh, 2017, this is all of the organizations that we know of that we have worked with across Ohio. So you'll see, of course, a lot of these are not within Appalachia. And that's that's fine that, um, you know, the the education programs, the uh, online webinars like like this one, um, they're not there. Everything is free. So it is open to anyone. I mean, folks from California could attend the online programs if they were interested. Um, but this is just a, a, a snapshot um, of the Ohio uh, cohort so far. Um, and of course, we don't we don't have, you know, ongoing necessarily connections and projects with each of these organizations. Um, it's just folks that have participated to some extent along the way. Out when we originally um, had the our first round of funding back again in 2017, um, we did this round of in-person workshops um, throughout throughout the entire region. So we we did a few. We did two events in uh, Ohio. We had some programs at the Southeast Ohio History Center, and then the the Denison Train Depot Museum. Um, but this is back in, in 2017, 2018. So um, the, the program has kind of grown and changed since then. But what we started out by uh, putting together this curriculum for basically an overview of trying to touch on just about anything that is comprises uh, collections, care, and management. So everything from best practices in preservation onto emergency response and planning. We, we planned and scheduled workshops at sites. We invited folks to come to us. And I'm saying that with, with intention because I, that one of the things that has changed about the program is the way that we're offering educational opportunities, but more about that in a second. Um, we also put together a series of webinars for the Regional Heritage Stewardship Program. These are all have all been recorded and are available um, free on the on our YouTube channel. Um, if the the link itself is just kind of a garbled mess of letters and numbers, so. Um, if there is a mechanism for, for follow-up after this program, I'll see if I can send out um, the direct link to our YouTube channel. But um, these were all the webinars that we did, again, back in 2017, 2018, uh, with some of the topics were just kind of similar across the board. Some of the topics like uh, historic preservation or integrated pest management were really specifically tailored to 
the region. So, you know, for historic preservation, what are the types of buildings and structures that we're most commonly finding uh, within Appalachia? And I am going to just take a bit of a sidestep here and tell you about um, a different project that we did that kind of brought us to this model of programming. Um, so the, the initial regional work, our first kind of foray into regional stewardship was right within the Philadelphia region. Um, this program began all the way back in 2002 with funding from the William Penn Foundation, a Philadelphia-based foundation that funds regional initiatives in a variety of fields, um, but one of them being uh, arts and culture. So we, you know, I mentioned the organization's been around since 1977. Uh, we've been doing preservation work, planning and assessments since the early 1980s. But we had um, an evaluation of all of our services done by an external consultant, and it found that organizations reported high levels of satisfaction with the findings of their needs assessment reports, um, but they also had high levels of frustration with internal stewardship issues. So what it revealed kind of a significant gap between acceptance of the recommendations our team was giving them and the actual ability of the organizations to implement those recommendations or changes. So from this, we really determined that while it's fantastic for institutions to have their preservation needs assessed and recorded in a report, this is not the end of the process. In order for collections care and stewardship initiatives to be sustainable, there needs to be some built-in mechanism for follow through. Um, so just to show you some representative data from a survey that we did uh, throughout Pennsylvania. Um, so we, we polled organizations all throughout the state and then we kind of cross-checked uh, respondents from everywhere else in Pennsylvania versus respondents from the Philadelphia stewardship region, which as I indicated on the last slide, it wasn't just Philadelphia, but Philadelphia and five surrounding counties. So, and I'll just go kind of quickly through some of these findings, but uh, for environmental monitoring, for example, across the entire state, 22.4% um, of respondents were doing some level of environmental monitoring throughout collections areas. But for those organizations that had participated in the stewardship program, um, that number jumped up to 40%. Similarly for light, uh, when asking if, if organizations control light levels to meet the specifications for preservation of collections, um, 21.5 from across the state, and that goes up to 35% from organizations who had participated in the stewardship program. And then this is, is definitely the most drastic improvement when we asked about how many organizations had up-to-date preservation needs assessments and preservation plans. Um, as you can see, the stewardship participants we're really blowing this one out of the water. So 73% um, 73 plus percent with an up-to-date needs assessment versus um, just shy of 18% and 68.4 had a had an up-to-date preservation plan as opposed to 12.1. So, you know, there, there was a notable impact. Participants in the Philadelphia Stewardship Program also were able to leverage their report assessment and planning documents for additional funding for preventive conservation and uh, conservation treatment. Um, and, and this number up here, the 1 million plus, this is actually, this is already quite dated. This is from a survey that we did 
gosh, I, I believe it was in 2012. So it's over 10 years old at this point. Um, so, you know, I'm, I don't know how much the number has increased since then, but um, it was a notable, a notable impact. So um, that's, that was my, my sidestep of our kind of inspiration. Um, and now back to what we are, the program at hand. So uh, the program, as I mentioned, was technically launched back in 2017, um, but with, you know, of course, we all know what happened uh, just a few years after that, and with some major um, pandemic-related lulls, as well as staff turnover, departmental losses, et cetera, um, it had, has been on a real hold for some time. But I'm very, very excited to share that as of just about a month and a half ago, um, the beginning of April, we have new funding. So we are really looking at it going forward as a relaunch, a revitalization of efforts that we're just beginning to really productively move forward towards coalescing um, when we hit some roadblocks. So uh, we have funding now through um, basically mid spring of 2026. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of just, I'm, I'm meeting you just at the beginning of this round of funding. So what will be, we actually be doing um, over the next two years? One of the biggest things that we're going to be working on is doing a series of preservation needs assessments. So we're going to be um, this is way too dense text. You don't have to actually read it, but basically uh, preservation needs assessments are a process in which we come on site to an organization and look at anything and everything that impacts collections, care, and management. Everything from the policies you have in place, the resources you have at hand, um, on down to the most kind of granular um, how are objects stored on the shelf or in the drawer? Um, you, you get a very comprehensive report at the end of it that then can be used, as, as I mentioned, it can be leveraged for future grant funding. Um, many, particularly federal grants, require some sort of assessment like this to be in place in order to apply for funding for uh, preservation projects. Um, you can, of course, use it to kind of take the next steps and adapt it into a preservation plan. Um, it can be really fantastic for internal advocacy, so making the case for preservation to your administration, board, um, potential funders, et cetera. There, there are a lot of different services that the needs assessment can um, provide down the line in addition to just the initial kind of pointing out of uh, needs and recommendations. It is, the, the needs assessments are completely free of charge. Uh, there's no need, you know, the grant covers everything, including travel and everything. Um, and this is the one piece of the initiative that really is limited to those organizations based in, um, Appalachian region designated counties. Um, so while the education programs and everything are open to all, um, this, this is going to be specifically focused on Appalachia. A new initiative that we are just kind of in, in the very initial planning phases for, we haven't launched it yet, um, and are, are definitely interested in, in feedback on if you all think this would be uh, an effective process in order to kind of facilitate um, some of that, that networking and the more kind of soft on the ground uh, interactions. We are going to, um, we're, we're hoping to launch uh, mentorship circles. Um, so these are, um, it is a, a mentorship cohort, but rather than having 
for example, a more seasoned professional and an emerging professional or, or student um, just kind of paired up, uh, we're, we're trying to connect folks from all different stages of your stages and ranges of experience. So, you know, the, the biggest example being kind of mid-career professionals might sometimes struggle to fit into the traditional mentorship model um, because they have some aspects where they're able to serve as a mentor, but also might still be seeking mentorship themselves. Um, and likewise, collections volunteers might feel like they don't fit into these one-on-one -on -one relationships as their needs are not necessarily to set professional goals and find job opportunities, but rather expand their understanding of how to best care for collections. So we're, we're trying this different model where each circle has, as you can see, uh, four to six individuals at various points in their career. And we are um, going to be facilitating discussions and conversations among these groups. So stay tuned for more about that as it comes out. We did uh, back at the at the end of kind of the initial previous phase of this, we did have the program evaluated by an external consultant um, who found that there were increases throughout the regions in just the sort of goals we we're looking for, you know, connection to preservation resources, feeling like part of a network of collections care, et cetera. Um, but we also recognize that there was a lot more that we had to do. Um, and then, oh, my next, I'm looking at my notes and my next two slides are actually kind of skipped around. So one, <laughs> I'll, I'll go back. Um, but as far as what's next, uh, so we have right now, uh, applications are open for the round of those free preservation needs assessments. On the last slide, I'll give you the link to the page on our website where those applications live. Um, and please go, go check them out. I'll also give you my email as well. And definitely um, let me know if you have any questions about that process. The deadline says uh, that they are due on May 31st, but I know um, it's not a it's not a super cumbersome application, but it does require a little bit of gathering of resources. So I know that you know that's kind of just right around the corner. My recommendation would be if you go check out the applications and determine that you want to apply, please just shoot me an email. And even if you're not able to get it through by May 31st, there will be absolutely no penalty for that. We are. We're actively looking for applicants. We're not in a situation where we're necessarily going to be, we, we may accept all of the applications that we get, I'll put it that way. Um, so please, please reach out if you are interested, even if you can't necessarily make that deadline. The best way to make sure you get more information from us about the work that we have coming out down the pike as well is to sign up to receive our newsletter, um, which again, it, there's a link to that on my, my last contact slide, but you are always more than welcome to reach out to me directly as well. Um, email is definitely best and I'm, I'm totally happy to take any questions along the way. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is I mentioned that we started out the program back in 2017 through 19, uh, planning workshops and inviting participants to come to us. This is something that we have changed. We learned and fully recognized that this is not always feasible. You know, time and resources are limited and you all have enough work ahead of you already that asking folks to take time out of your day-to-day -day is just not always the best way to provide learning opportunities. 
So going forward, we are really going to be focusing on partnering with already established events, such as conferences like this, um, workshops in conjunction with professional associations, uh, learning opportunities for um, established networks or, or kind of, um, for example, I did a, a in-person training session for uh, librarians from all of the public libraries in one county in West Virginia. And it was just kind of a, it, that training was was part of their, part of their operations. And so I, I came to them. So we are more than happy to come give a workshop or preservation related presentation at your institution or at your group's event. So please, please just let me know again. We have the funding to, to do this, so um, we, we need to use it and we want to travel to you. And with that, I will go back to um, this, another kind of dense uh, list of questions here. So these are, if anyone does want to chime in and kind of um, help me out with some discussion, um, Please take a moment to, to read through these and let me know if you have thoughts about any of these. This is also, again, if I, I know, you know, sometimes, especially towards the end of a conference day, um, brains are maybe getting glazed over. So this is also if you want to take note of any of these prompts and follow up via email, um, please do. But also, I would be happy to just kind of take questions as well. Oh, Michelle, you I didn't realize you that's fantastic. The the YouTube channel link uh to our to our direct channel is in the chat. So yeah. great. Well thanks Diani uh so much for this information. Um if anybody would like to respond to the questions here on the prompt, um, please do you feel free to drop your responses into the chat, or if you are comfortable, um, feel free to unmute and um, go ahead and, and voice your, um, your thoughts about these discussion prompts. Um, while everyone collects their thoughts, I thought I might um, lead with a, a question of my own. Um, and that's just, um, I know you're kind of launching this. Do you envision perhaps using this model of kind of like regional outreach um, in other parts of the country in the future? Or um, what are your plans in that area? That is a that is a very good question. And yes, absolutely. I mean, we're uh, our our staff are limited, so there's kind of only kind of so far that we could go. But yes, this is definitely a model that, as I mentioned, um, this program kind of specifically built out of a, a program that we did right in the Philadelphia region. Um, we have a similar preservation-focused initiative running throughout New York State right now. And we also actually, our newest project kind of along these lines is in, in Puerto Rico. Um, so we partnered with a historic preservation, um, you know, building an architectural preservation organization there. And um, my, my colleague who's the project lead on that is actually in Puerto Rico right now um, teaching preservation related programs. So yes, definitely. I mean, they all, they all look a little different. Um, we, we try to really meet folks where they are and kind of meet the needs of the particular constituents in, in the different regions. Um, and we, we also, uh, back in the initial round, there was actually a third cohort, uh, based kind of based around Utah. So it was Utah and the surrounding states. Um, folks who were involved in that actually took the experience of working with us and went on to apply for and successfully receive their own NEH grant to run a whole series of preservation resources. So, I mean, that in some ways that's like almost the best outcome. I. I absolutely love doing this work. I'm, I'm, as Michelle mentioned, I'm from Ohio, so I'm, I'm devoted to um, continuing to, to make these connections and, and come to the regions. But 
you know, sustainability wise, if partners are able to kind of take, take some element and run with it, um, that's, that's fantastic too. So we don't, we don't have any, I mean, as if that's not enough, we, we don't have any plans about other regions of the country at this point, but. Great. Thank you. Other feedback or questions? In terms of your mentor circles, are those going to be the best place to learn about those on your website newsletter? Yes. Yeah. I think, I mean, either, as I mentioned, either you, you will definitely find out about it if you um, sign up for our newsletter, which it's not, we won't spam you. We usually, I think two emails a month is about the most we send out. Um, so you can definitely sign up for information there, or as, as always, you're just totally welcome to reach out to me directly. Um, I'm torn between leaving it on this slide and for, for food for thought and just, um, getting to my last slide with the contact info, but um, I'll, I'll pop my email in the chat. Okay. Thanks, Dehani. Going to be silent for a few more seconds here. All right, I am going to go forward to. Um, that is the link for the um, kind of info page on our website, and that is my email at the bottom and. If we are going to wrap up, I just want to say thank you again to the NEH and um, to the Society of Ohio Archivists for having me along. Um, one more plug, we applications are open for the needs assessments now and technically will be for another two weeks, but you are granted an extension if you reach out to me. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, Diani, and not seeing any other um, comments coming forward. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here today. It really concludes our first day. Um, we hope to see many of you again tomorrow, um, either virtually or in person at Capital University. Um, just a reminder that there is free on-site parking at Capital. I've dropped the link about the parking um, lots that are available, the closest ones, as well as a link to the campus map um, to help you navigate um, to the union. Um, and then we just ask you to take a moment and please um, give us some feedback about how we're doing with the with the meetings and the session. And uh, thanks again for being here and have a great rest of your day. Safe travels all. Thanks so much, everyone. And I hope to meet some of y'all uh, in, in person or on another virtual event like this. Please just be in touch. Thanks.